Welcome to this presentation on post-installed fiber optic pressure sensors. We're applying these to sub-C production risers, in this case for severe slugging control. The authors on this paper are Amin Eaton, Mustafa Safdarnajad, myself John Hedengren, Christy Moffat and Casey Hubble, all from Brigham Young University, and then David Brower and Alexis Brower from Astro Technology. So a little bit about Astro Technology. Astro uh, has been in business for many years working on uh, fiber optic systems. Uh, first for demilitarization with uh, this is in this case this is an intercontinental continental ballistic missile and the demilitarization uh, with Russia um, also here is the um, this is the uh, robonaut the uh, uh, hand of the robonaut the the uh, astronaut um, uh, uh, robot that goes went into space and they instrumented the uh, joints of the, uh, the hand with fiber optic sensors to be able to give feedback so that they gave the, uh, the robot uh, uh, an amount of dexterity. Okay, the offices are in Houston um, for Astro Technology. Uh, Astro is, is focused on subsea fields, pipelines and risers and LNG facilities after also becoming involved in uh, aerospace industry. So engineering capabilities at Astro Technology include system integration, real-time embedded systems, uh, the st stress analysis, uh, fiber optic sensing technology we'll be talking a little bit about uh, today, also conventional sensor integration, uh, environmentally hardened systems, so you can imagine fiber optics are very delicate. How do you uh, put those into an oil and gas operation where you need a ruggedized environment, um, and uh, software development. So we're gonna be focusing today on some technology with fiber optics and also software um, development for those. Uh, previous installations on uh, risers, um, also flow lines, you can see the clam shells there, the, the sensor stations that are put on, um, and additionally, um, you know, drilling risers and, uh, and others. So a lot of things are subsea where you need to monitor temperature pressure or strain vibration. Okay, so need for better subsea instrumentation is that you want to be able to detect um, these early warning signs, uh, meaning that, you know, it, it, we can either take a preventative approach or a reactive approach in many cases, and so we need to have monitoring systems so that we can see early warning signs and be able to take a small action now versus a very uh, large uh, action trying to respond to a, a critical situation. Um, also, we want to automate the monitoring of these critical systems so that as we see these early warning signs, we not only have humans that um, can respond to it, but also computer systems that can see these early warning signs and take automated action. Uh, we are wanting to monitor pressure, temperature, strain, and flow. Those are some of the big items that we want to see uh, for flow assurance, for uh, fatigue analysis. You know, there's a number of other areas of application of this. Um, we want to give um, information to key decision makers as well, not only con to computer systems, but those who can make decisions um, about how to operate or uh, uh, production. Um, also, we want to eliminate uh, or reduce downtime, production unscheduled uh, downtime, again, due to flow assurance, uh, which is uh, very common issue, uh, also prevent asset damage and pipeline leaks, okay, to be able to determine uh, where are the leaks and, and uh, how big they are. Uh, also reduce safety and environmental risks as well. So these are the reasons why we need uh, subsea instru instrumentation. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the new developments that have come recently. Uh, overview of new developments are um, you know, the improved post-installed. So when we talked about post-installed, that means the brownfield where the equipment's already in existence, it may be uh, continuing to operate, you don't want to shut down in order to be able to install these sensors. And then also uh, non-penetrating as well. Uh, sensors are great, but if, if you have to penetrate into the flow line or the structure, then you may lose some mechanical reliability of that structure. Um, also, that can be very difficult to do on existing systems, uh, especially those that are operating. And then focusing also on fiber optic sensors. So some improvements in this area that I'll, I'll share. 
Also, we're going to uh, talk about an application to severe slugging um, and how we automate that. Um, we've also quantified the benefit of the subsea pressure sensing uh, with some uh, estimates on, uh, on payback periods um, and, uh, and for this slugging control. Also demonstrated long service life. One of the recent advancements is that uh, we've been able to uh, continually monitor some of these systems and have just an updated report on the long-term service life potential of these systems. So let's talk about slugging first of all. We have uh, a two-phase uh, flow coming from the reservoir, and this is uh, sub C right here. Uh, you know, this can be many kilometers uh, long, but uh, the characteristic of slugging is that you have a decline here, okay, so an angle theta, and uh, you get pooling of liquid in this area, and there's sufficient pressure it pushes that liquid slug up to the topside equipment and then it has to handle it um, topside. Okay, so some of the problems um, with uh, slugging uh, then, um, a number of problems, um, but uh, you have reduced production in general. You can uh, fill up uh, separators, for example, and uh, you know to cause disturbances if you don't have a constant flow rate. You also have vibration and uh, riser fatigue as these slugs move up. Uh, they cause uh, vibration and, and fatigue of the structure uh, and the pipeline. Uh, you also need to have maybe some added equipment. So slug catchers, for example, are very common uh, to be able to catch these uh, slugs as they move up and it just increases the equipment costs. Okay, so automation solution for this. Um, we need a sensor. And this is, uh, this is what we're going to do. We're going to measure pressure um, right here at the touchdown zone. Okay, so this riser section right here can be, uh, you know, several thousand feet. Um, and uh, right as it starts to curve up, that's a, uh, the place where we want to measure the pressure. Okay, most systems don't have a pressure measurement there. They maybe have a uh, pressure measurement um, topside maybe before or after uh, the valve, but uh, the critical one that will show is that we need to measure pressure um, here at the bottom of the riser where the slugs are forming. Okay, so we need uh, this pressure sensor, and we'll talk about that with respect to fiber optic uh, monitoring. Okay, then we also uh, need an actuator as well. So we're going to adjust uh, this valve topside um, you could also have a valve, uh, let's say, uh, near the wellhead uh, that you adjust as well, but just for the purposes of this discussion, we'll just um, automate uh, this valve. Okay, so that's going to be the actuator. And then the last thing we need is a controller. So we want to try to maintain a constant flow, and we'll do that by maintaining pressure uh, here at the, the top side, okay, and maintain two-phase flow. We'll do that with a proportional integral derivative controller and also show how it works with the model predictive controller. So improved, let's talk about the sensor first of all. Um, so this is improved clamp design. Um, you can see this is a uh, 3D printed uh, 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 mold and uh, this, is, this is the basis of the new clamp design. There's um, you know, these uh, pockets right here that help with adhesive spreading, also applying the, uh, the fiber optic sensors. Um, so this clamp design has been optimized to give the maximum uh, adhesive properties to the existing structures. And it's, it's typically customized, you know, for risers of different diameters, um, different structures like trees, uh, other things are subsea. Uh, it's going to have different mold uh, for attaching these clamps. So I just want to talk uh, about the uh, first one, which is a, a friction clamp. Um, so if you don't, if it's deep, uh, you know, subsea, you may need an, a remotely operated vehicle, an ROV, uh, to be able to, um, uh, to install this. You can't do it with divers. Uh, so this is a friction clamp that simply bolts down and around uh, the pipeline or the structure. 
uh, and allows uh, this coupling of the sensors that are located here on this uh, friction clamp it allows the coupling of these sensors uh, to the pipeline or the structure and then you can start measuring the changes in strain. So for pressure you want to measure the hoop strain. Okay, So as the pressure uh, increases the pipe diameter is going to slightly increase and then we can measure that with a fiber optic sensor the change in strain. You also have an adhesive clamp now in this case, here's the uh, polyurethane body. You have some band clamps, a handle, and some exit cables. In this case, um, you know, we don't see the bolt down design. Um, these are just to hold it in place uh, while the adhesive dries. And then the uh, sensors are then coupled to the structure. Okay, so here's an example of a diver that was installing uh, one of these clamps. Um, they have about 15 minutes from when they apply the adhesive to when it cures. So um, they prepared uh, this surface. You can see that right here. Um, and the diver came down um, to this area and placed the clamp onto uh, this surface and then used the band clamps just to hold it in place while the adhesive, you can see a little bit of the epoxy there, uh, while the adhesive dried. And then there was an excellent coupling between the sensors and the um, and uh, the structure. You can also see that they lined it up here as well. There are four sensors um, along the outside of this. Okay, so one, two, three, four. Uh, that's to get the axial bending um, of, this, uh, of this tendon. Okay, so let me talk a little bit now that we have the uh, sensor there. We also want to develop a controller that can then read those pressure sensors and then automatically adjust uh, the valve position up top in order to be able to eliminate this slugging. This is called model predictive control. And uh, this is the basis for the uh, control algorithm that we're using. We may have a model of the process. So here's maybe our pressure that we predict. Okay, that's our predicted um, pressure. So we have a relationship between the valve position and uh, the predicted pressure. And then we also have a desired or a target value that we're trying to drive to. So this is current time. I'll say that's time equals zero. Uh, that's current time. We're predicting off into the future with this predictive model that helps us see how we need to move our valve in order to be able to maintain uh, pressure. Okay, so here's the mathematical formulation of this, we have an objective function, We're trying to minimize the difference between the uh, trajectory and the prediction by adjusting uh, this, I'll call that P uh, for a parameter within our model a, uh, on the, in the predictive horizon. And we have collections of differential and algebraic equations that describe the relationship between the valve and uh, the pressure. Okay, so this is a, a first graph um, that shows some of the uh, results. We have, um, you know, just the natural slugging here. Okay, on the, on the bottom, you can see there's no control action taken there. And then at this point, right here, about 33 minutes into it, that's when the controller is turned on. And so the first thing that the valve does is it reduces, um, to prevent this uh, pressure spike and then it sees that it's going to be coming up more so it it makes this quick sequence of moves and then levels out now you can see this is fairly similar to what it was before but it just had to take these two quick actions to dampen out um, the cycle of slugging and then maintain a constant pressure now at this point we changed the um, so that's uh, no control in the left. And then we also have a set point. Okay, so you can see that's the desired pressure. And that's going to relate to a flow. So here we went up. Um, so a set point increased right there. And then what happened is um, the valve shut off for a brief period of time. And it came back up to a new uh, steady value, again, eliminating uh, the slugging. Okay, and then also for 
a pressure decrease, a slight opening of the valve, and then a constant ramp up and a level off. Okay, so um, both the PID and model predictive control did fairly well. Model predictive control maybe just did a little bit better. You can see in some of these areas it was just a little bit more uh, responsive, but fairly comparable. Okay, so let's talk about um, with sensor location because we've heard this as well. Where do we need to put the sensor uh, to have the best performance? So we have the valve that's going to be top side. Okay, that's going to be on the platform. Um, and uh, where along this route um, do we need to place, uh, place the sensor? Okay, and, and so with this, we derive a a delay, okay, so between where the slug forms and how long it takes to travel up to the valve, that's one of the critical things that we need to know because as the, uh, as the time delay increases, it becomes more difficult to control and respond to this because by the time you take an action on the valve and have sensed that pressure, maybe another slug is already on the way and you've done the wrong thing. Okay, so um, so this is our measurement time delay. Um, we have a height of our riser, so that might be um, in, in meters for the height. Um, and then density, okay, so kilogram per meter uh, cubed uh, diameter. Okay, I'm just doing the unit analysis on this, and then four times the uh, kilogram per second or per minute. Okay, so that uh, these all cancel out, and we're just left with uh, seconds or minutes. So that's is the uh, this is going to be the time delay. So between when the slug uh, forms and where we actually uh, measure it, uh, we want to see what is the uh, time delay, the measurement time delay um, between those two points. Okay, and so this is a derivation of that, uh, that measurement delay. Okay, so um, let's just take a look at uh, zero second delay. Uh, we have, could have 10 second uh, delay, 50 second, and then we're just saying 105 seconds, that would be on the, uh, you know, just installing a pressure sensor top side. Okay, so this is the, uh, this is a result of the red line, that is uh, no delay at all. And that's similar to the performance that we just saw. Um, now if we have 10 seconds of delay, so let's say we installed the sensor here um, on the riser, that uh, it doesn't respond um, you know, quite as well. There's just maybe just a little bit more undershoot right here, uh, but fairly similar in terms of performance. And we get up to uh, 50 seconds of delay. Um, you know, this is this uh, green line right here, and you can see that it has attenuated uh, some of the slugging, so the amplitude is not quite as large as it was before, but it's still um, slugging. Okay, and then also the same with 105 seconds of time delay. You can also see the valve is not moving very fast in support of um, uh, attenuating those slugs. It just takes these small actions, but very quick um, actions to be able to dampen out these slugs. So um, we feel like uh, if we had a sensor at 105 or 50 seconds, that it would not be able to uh, actively attenuate uh, this, this slugging phenomena. Okay, so let me talk just a little bit about long-term uh, service life. Now this is, um, this is last weekend I went out um, on a uh, and landed here at the, um, on a platform out in the Gulf of Mexico. This is a project, uh, the Bass Light uh, flow line on the ENI platform, Devil's Tower. And um, this was a project that was installed 10 years ago on the flow line. And uh, we went back to the system and um, with a uh, fiber optic connection to uh, the subsea flow line um, that went out uh, about, I think it was, fi it was 56 miles out to the wellhead, uh, and there's a post installed uh, sensor. So, this is the uh, Atwater Valley block uh, in the Mississippi Canyon, um, and this had an 8 inch diameter flow line, 
total flow line was uh, 56 miles in length. And there you can see the 50, 130 million cubic feet per day. This was a gas, a gas line, and then in uh, about 2,000 meters of water down at the wellhead, it was about 7,000 uh, feet, and closer here it was about uh, 5,600 uh, feet. But um, fiber optic sensing placed at uh, these three stations along the way at 18, 36, and 56 miles, monitoring uh, pressure, temperature, and then hoop and axial strain. And one of the interesting things is that this was installed um, about eight years ago and then commenced operation about seven years ago. And it was still in, in operation. And part of the reason for that is that uh, there's only electrical um, equipment up top, but everything else along uh, the flow line, um, everything is just uh, fiber optic based. So no electrical components, just a single strand of uh, fiber optic cable that's been ruggedized uh, for offshore. And uh, it was continue. it uh, still worked and uh, was providing readings um, to help them identify a hydrate plug. Okay, so new development summary, um, improved clamp design for ROV or diver installation. And in this particular case, we're interested in the, uh, in the touchdown zone um, for a riser. And uh, we want enhanced uh, automation. We did that with, we showed it with uh, proportional integral derivatives, or if we have a model, we can have predictive capabilities and include that in a model predictive uh, controllers and optimization technique. And then uh, the production increase, I didn't say much about this, but there's, uh, we've seen uh, prior papers where they've reported an increase in 8% as you uh, reduce the slugging that can uh, improve the uh, throughput by uh, a significant amount and um, you know, with that comes uh, substantial economic uh, benefits. Okay, and then uh, just showing at the end there, one fiber optics sensing system with uh, eight plus years of service life on a, a deep water flow line. In this case, it went from the uh, initial construction um, all the way to end of service life uh, without, without failure. Okay, so I just want to mention also the, the Clear Gulf project. Um, this is a collaboration between the oil and gas industry, NASA, and Astro Technology. A number of uh, proposed partners here. Um, and this is, uh, as I was mentioning, uh, focused on uh, these, these uh, preventative approaches where we take active monitoring at, for the subsea systems and uh, use uh, uh, preventative and, and soft touch versus a, a much larger response once the the uh, problems get out of hand. So it's creating uh, cutting edge techniques for managing production and safer and more environmentally sensitive systems for drilling and production and then uh, and also developing the technologies for challenges faced when working in a remote and harsh environments. Okay so focus on assets such as platforms, risers, flow lines, subsea equipment, deep water wells, and downhole operations. Okay, thank you for your attention. I'll be glad to take any questions.